You're at war. You're a general. You launch an offensive that does serious damage to the enemy and reaches the point where it may decide the war. All you need is for your armies, other generals, to attack your other enemy. But what happens when that diversion doesn't divert? Let's find out. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, the German flying ace Max Immelmann died. The Germans used deadly new phosgene gas at Verdun, but couldn't break through. The Russians were swarming all over Bukovina, but their forces far to the north were not attacking the Germans to prevent them from sending help to the Austrians. The Russian 9th Army stood, as the week began, on a line that ran from Kolomea down through Kuti and then to the Romanian border, threatening the Hungarian mountain passes. The Brusilov Offensive, named after General Alexei Brusilov, had forced the Austrians back over the past three weeks and taken hundreds of thousands of prisoners. The Austro-Hungarian High Command issued this proclamation. Every man in the army must be aware that he is fighting here to decide the campaign and to decide the fate of the fatherland. It's pretty dramatic, but also no longer entirely accurate. The Austrian 7th Army alone had lost 133,000 men, 40,000 of them taken prisoner. But the Russians were pretty close to their limit as well, and they were now faced with the job of pursuing Austrian forces through a broad network of valleys towards the Carpathians. Still though, the Russian 9th Army took Kolomea June 29th, causing another 40,000 Austro-Hungarian casualties and taking 10,000 more prisoners, even though it was clear to Russian General Platon Leschitsky that he didn't have the men to force the Carpathian passes. But the Russians did have enough men to possibly destroy the remaining might of the Austrian army, if only that army was not reinforced by Germany. In order to prevent that, Generals Evert and Kuropatkin in the far north were to attack the Germans to keep them busy. They had 90 divisions, 750,000 more men than the Germans, and two-thirds of the total Russian artillery. But for two weeks, they had delayed their attacks, and a frustrated Brusilov saw his chance slipping away. Their attack was now planned for July 3rd. German Army Chief of Staff Erich von Falkenhayn had acted quickly to save some Austrian bacon. He had sent four divisions to help the defense of Kovel, but he had had it with Austrian failures in the field, and his end game was to take over control of the whole Eastern Front. He demanded that Alexander von Linsingen be placed in command of the Austrian First and Fourth Armies. He had also proposed, two weeks ago, that August von Mackensen, who had devastated the Russians last year, be in charge of the front from the Pripet to the Dniester. Austrian Chief of Staff Konrad von Hotzendorf refused this, but saw few alternatives to coming under German control. Linsingen's forces had prevented the Russians from taking Kovel, but his counter-offensives over the past two weeks had been generally unsuccessful, though they had frustrated Brusilov for the moment, and Brusilov had ordered most of his units to dig in and prepare to renew the offensive July 3rd. There was another offensive that was just about to begin as well at the Somme River. On June 24th came the beginning of the preliminary artillery barrage at the Somme along an 18-kilometer front. 1,500 guns and howitzers fired 1,732,873 shells. Many were duds, and many others just churned up the surface instead of damaging the deep German dugouts though this still raised Allied morale considerably. But there were ominous reports from attempted British trench raids during lulls in the barrage. Raids attempted all along the Corps front were unsuccessful, in some sectors owing to intense machine gun and rifle fire. The offensive itself was to begin the 29th, but heavy rains and a late realization that the barrage might not have been terribly effective caused a two-day postponement. But the final reports at the end of the week were positive. Visually, the effects were impressive. Slowly, the German reserves, which had been pretty depleted by the Battle of Verdun, began to move north to the Somme. And battery by battery, the German guns began to leave Verdun and also head north, though June 24th 
marked the farthest the Germans had advanced in the four months of fighting at Verdun. And further southeast, Austria was pulling back from its furthest advance against Italy. Though in the Trentino on June 28th, the Austrians bombarded the Italians with hydrocyanide, seriously injuring or killing 6,000 sleeping Italians. The next day, the gas blew back on the Austrians, causing 1,000 casualties. But this week, the Italians retook both Asiago and Arciero. Both had been burned and ransacked before, though. The Austrian lines on the Asiago Plateau were now well within the 1866 border, which flew in the face of Italian Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna's claims that the enemy would never set foot on sacred Italian soil. The Italians had taken just under 150,000 casualties in the offensive, about 50,000 more than the Austrians, and the Trentino salient stuck out and looked really insecure. The Italian press backed Cadorna, the Generalissimo, and called him a genius once the balance of battle had shifted to the Italians' favor. The one of Cadorna's deputies had this to say. Why was Cadorna allowed to celebrate this grievous episode of the war and boast about it as something glorious? But the PR machine ignored all the oversights and all the errors that had allowed the Austrians to take so much ground so quickly. And the Italian people were pretty desperate for some good news. For Konrad von Hotzendorf, the Austrian gains made were nothing compared with his disaster against the Russians. He had underestimated the men he'd need for the Italian offensive anyhow. He didn't imagine how much difference a Russian attack could make. He didn't use General Borojevich von Bonja and his army to make a diversion on the Isonzo, and because of all of this, his prestige in Vienna and Budapest was now at a new low. And here's a note to round out the week. On June 28th, there was a three-day protest in Germany. 55,000 German workers took part. Karl Liebknecht, the one anti-war member of the Reichstag, was expelled from the Reichstag and sentenced to two years hard labor for urging soldiers not to fight. Later, it would be increased to four years. So the week ends with artillery at the Somme, poison gas in Trentino, tens of thousands of Austrian prisoners in Galicia, and protests on the German home front. I don't know if you've ever watched the documentary The Civil War by Ken Burns, but he illustrates a lot of the American Civil War with letters from the front. So I'm going to do that too. Here's a letter I found in Peter Hart's The Great War, written by Captain Charles May on June 30th, 1916, one day before the men went over the top at the Somme. I must not allow myself to dwell on the personal, but I do not want to die. Not that I mind for myself, if it be that I am to go, I am ready. But the thought that I may never see you or our darling baby again turns my bowels to water. My one consolation is the happiness that has been ours. Also, my conscience is clear that I have tried to make life a joy to you. But it is the thought that we may be cut off from one another, which is so terrible, and that our babe may grow up without my knowing her and without her knowing me, it is difficult to face. And I know your life without me would be a dull blank, but to you will be left the greatest charge in all the world, the upbringing of our baby. God bless that child. She is the hope of life to me, my darling, au revoir. It may well be that you will only have to read these lines as ones of passing interest. On the other hand, they may well be my last message to you. If they are, know through all your life that I loved you and the baby with all my heart and soul, that you two sweet things were just all the world to me. I pray God I may do my duty, for I know whatever that may entail, you would not have it otherwise. Charles May, wife of Bessie and father of Pauline, was killed the following day. If you'd like to find out more about Sir Douglas Haig, the mastermind of this British offensive and also known sometimes as the Butcher of the Somme, you can click right here to see our bio special about him. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Bernhard Rindlisbacher. Your support on Patreon is a tremendous help for us. If you'd like to find out more about helping our show, visit our Patreon page. You can also follow us on Instagram to learn even more about the First World War. See you next time.